Hello this evening. My name is Adam Rubin, and I'm the senior rabbi of Beth Jacob Congregation just outside of St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first annual Alan Gorin Lecture entitled Israel and Palestine, Independent and Interdependent. Many people were involved in the organizing of this event, but the primary vision, energy, and effort that went into making it happen came from my distinguished predecessor, the emeritus and founding rabbi of Beth Jacob, Rabbi Morris Allen and his wife, Dr. Phyllis Gorin. Now in ordinary circumstances, one might read a compelling op-ed in the New York Times and recommend it to friends and family, or perhaps post it on one's Twitter feed or Facebook page. But these are not ordinary times and Morris and Phyllis are indeed extraordinary people. They perceive very clearly the urgency of the current situation in Israel-Palestine and transform their reaction to that article into the event taking place right now. Both they and the members of Beth Jacob Congregation are passionately committed to the idea that Judaism and Jewish tradition must be engaged with the world and must seek to transform it into a more just and peaceful place. I'm delighted to introduce our moderator, who will in turn introduce our, our guests and speakers, uh, Professor Sharon Press is the director of the Dispute Res Resolution Institute at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. She teaches mediation and negotiation and a mediation clinic. In addition, Professor Press directs the Israel Study Abroad Program, conflict resolution from religious traditions, coaches the mediation representation team, and serves as the academic advisor to the students who are completing a certificate in conflict resolution theory and practice. And so Professor Press, without further ado, take it away. Thank you so much, Rabbi Rubin. It is a real honor for me to serve in this role of moderator for what promises to be an engaging conversation with our two distinguished guests. And I can't think of a better way for Beth Jacob to honor Rabbi Allen and Phyllis Gorin than through a lecture series and for this particular one, featuring Sam Bahor and Bernard Abishai, okay, who now ideas about Israel, Palestine, independent and interdependent. Before I introduce our guests, I invite you to engage with this program in the spirit of curiosity and openness to new thoughts and new perspectives that perhaps you haven't considered before. In my work as a mediator, I've learned the value in approaching listening in this spirit. Christian Wyman once wrote, words are tied ineluctably to the world. Language has its bloodlines through history and through our own beating hearts. Today, we will hear the words and language from the minds and hearts, the bloodlines of two extraordinary men who have sought to act as well as to speak on a stage populated by risk they deserve an attentive ear. I want to thank John Davidson for introducing me to some poets and their poems to, step, to set the stage for our time together. We begin with a poem of the Jewish American writer, Marge Piercy, which speaks to one choosing to act, not just sit, amidst the uncertainties and necessities of the present moment, a very fitting way for us to welcome our guests. To be of use. The people I love the best jump into work headfirst without dallying in the shallows and swim off with shore strokes almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, the black sleek heads of seals bouncing like half submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves, an ox to a heavy cart, who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire to be put out. The work of the world is common as mud. Botched, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust, but the thing worth doing well done has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amorphous for wine or oil. Hopi vases that you held corn are put in museums. 
but you know they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. Both of our speakers were born and raised in the United States before making their own version of Aliyah to their homeland. Bernard to Israel first in 1972 and Sam to Palestine in 1994. As you will learn, Sam and Bernard both have highly developed expertise in business. You have full bios on the flyer for this program, so I'll keep my introductions brief. Sam Bahor is managing partner of Applied Information Management, where he specializes in startups and providing executive counsel. He was instrumental in establishing the Palestine Telecommunications Company and the Arab Palestine Shopping Center. Sam serves in several community organizations, including being the co-founder of Americans for a Vibrant Palestinian Economy and as a board member of Just Vision. Bernard Abishai is an adjunct professor of business at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and has also taught at Duke University, MIT, and Dartmouth College, as well as serving as the director of the Zell Entrepreneurship Program at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya. He has served as the International Director of Intellectual Capital at KBGM LLP and was a technology editor for the Harvard Business Review from 1986 to 1991. I hope that many of you read the op-ed written by Sam and Bernie that appeared in the New York Times where they made the case for a new approach to thinking about Israel and Palestine. Specifically, they wrote, and I quote, to live and thrive, Israel and Palestine must arrive at both independence and interdependence, two states sharing what must be shared and separating only where they can. The way our program will run today is that Bernie and Sam will take some time to explain their thoughts and then we'll have the opportunity for some question and answer. If you have questions, you can type them into the chat where I will be able to see them. I will explain how we'll handle that portion when we get to it. For now, please do make sure that you remain on mute. Before they take some time to elaborate on these thoughts, I'd like for Sam and Bernie, and they have given me permission to refer to them in this way, to talk a little bit about the values that underlie their own journeys from the United States to Israel and Palestine, and also to describe how they first met. Sam and Bernie? Sam, I don't, I think, do you want me to go first? Go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks very much for being here. And I, I can't resist reacting to that poem um, and the, uh, the idea of being activist in this sense. Um, my colleague at the New Yorker magazine, uh, Bill McGibbon, who focuses on um, environmental issues was once asked, what's his theory of change? And he said, I'll write an article and things will change. Um, I think we both have a slightly more modest view of the reach of uh, any particular article or even a long series of articles. Um, having said that, we um, are very gratified that um, the word confederation is starting to enter into uh, common parlance, and maybe it's even a matter of frustration for us that um, people have been talking about peace uh, between Israel and Palestine for uh, two generations and haven't recognized um, that confederation was always the only way this was ever going to happen. Now, Sam may have a slightly different view, actually, but I'll speak for myself. Um, how we met, um, it's actually in some ways relevant to how we continue to work. There was a uh, um, gathering of uh, peace activists in Ramallah, I think it was around 2005, and uh, it was all the usual suspects, people from all the NGOs in Israel and outside of Israel. And um, when it was all over, uh, or just about to end, 
I asked to address everyone and I got up and just looked around the room and said, how many of you are involved in some way with academic institutions? And like 150 hands went up. I said, how many of you in those academic institutions have ever been to the business school on your campus? And no hands went up. And I said, you know, um, to have a conference about peace between Israel and Palestine and not to recognize that the business communities on both sides of the line are going to be the most um, profound um, activists for peace in the long run for all kinds of reasons um, and not to have business people here at a conference like this is a, is a real shame. We have to begin to understand the transactional nature of peace on the ground. Um, and as I was leaving, Sam took his card and put it in my pocket and I called him the next day and I don't think we've stopped talking since. Um, uh, by the way, I should just correct one thing. I wasn't born in the United States. I am a naturalized American. I was born in Montreal, Canada, where the word confederation is second nature. Um, and I think that also has something to do with uh, where I've landed here. But Sam, would you go on? I mean, I think uh, I didn't, I sort of uh, skirted past the question of values. I'll let you speak for me on that. Sure. Um, I too first want to thank uh, the venue and Rabbi Morris and Phyllis. Um, it, this is an example of speaking and working nonstop to the point where some people in our own community say, why do you keep doing that? Why do you keep talking to groups coming through? And Rabbi Morris struck it home, uh, proving that people are listening and people care and find in their own communities how to translate what they heard and what they saw here. So I welcome this venue and I'm honored to be part of the first uh, session. Um, I, I also wanted to take note of that poem. I have another Israeli friend, she's in Southern Israel and she's a, a, older than, a generation older than me and she and I are always in contact. And we came up with a summary of that poem in one word, which is doing what a woodpecker does, which is chip, 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 chip away and it actually results in the tree falling sooner or later. Um, I would just a brief about myself. I'm a Palestinian American born to a Palestinian father and a Lebanese American mother. My father is Muslim. My mother is Christian. I like to say that I'm a happy Jew as Sam. Um, and I've been working in the uh, arena of Palestine, uh, Israel, since I awoke to being politically able to act. Um, that was in the late 70s, early 80s, and I haven't stopped since. Uh, when the Oslo Accords were signed, uh, I, as a private citizen, actually read them. I probably read them one time too many, and I like to half joke, uh, halfingly joke, uh, to say that I'm probably one of 12 Palestinians worldwide that actually read the entire set of documents more than once. And I came away from those not to, not to blow my horn here, uh, but saying this is not going to end the occupation. This is reshuffling the, uh, the checkerboard, but it's not ending the occupation per se. But that reshuffling was enough for me to pick up with my Palestinian wife at the time. We had just been married for a year, almost over a year, uh, and my one-year-old daughter. And we picked up and relocated from Youngstown, Ohio, to my ancestral home in Albira next to Ramallah. And that's where I, I speak from today. And I was actually, I had a soft landing coming back to Palestine or coming to Palestine because I never lived here before. I only visited every summer because I was recruited by a group of investors that wanted to implement one section of the Oslo Accord, which was the ability for Palestine, to, Palestinians to establish a, a, a telecommunications company. A long story short, that company was the one that I helped create and uh, it is the largest private sector employer today in Palestine. In a way, it's a story in itself. Um, I finished that project with the Tel Aviv University to get an MBA degree from the Kellogg Reconati Business School uh, program. It's a joint program between uh, Northwestern and Tel Aviv University. 
I was only able to go because I hold a US passport. And at the time, Israel had yet refused to give me residency here. So I was on a three month visa, having to leave the country every three months. Uh, but that allowed me to buy an Israeli car and to be able to drive in Israel. So for two years, I was going back and forth to Tel Aviv University, got my MBA degree, came back to Ramallah, established a consulting firm, and was hired to put together the first Palestinian shopping center, which is another successful project, difficult one because it was built during the second intifada. Both of the companies I helped create are publicly traded companies, so you can find them on the Palestinian Securities Exchange. Um, but my, and now I'm back into consultancy full time. My wife uh, laughs when I say that because I spend around 30 to 40% of my time in civil society, giving talks, meeting people like yourself and writing. Um, I do this because although I am trained as a business person, I'm actually trained as a computer technologist. I was a software developer in the States. Um, I'm trained as a business person but I have enough wisdom to know that political economy is one concept because too many people today study it in school as one concept. And as soon as they walk out with their, their degree, the political people take one road and the economic people take another road. I think in reality, it's still very intertwined. So although I work in economy, I work within a political context. And maybe that's why I'm so engaged in talking about the politics of the situation as much as I can get excited about talking about the economy of the situation. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, when I met, met Bernie, we had many, many discussions, uh, many of them in person, because at that time, again, I was a tourist here, uh, and I happened to be a tourist for 15 years. So I was able to go and come to Jerusalem and meet uh, at cafes around his home, and he would come here. Um, that's no longer possible. Partly because now there is a wall between me and Bernie, there's checkpoints between me and Bernie. And after 15 years, I was able to acquire from the Israeli military a residency status. So now I am a resident of the West Bank because I'm married to a Palestinian woman. 15 years to get that. But although I, I'm still an American citizen because a residency status does not mean change of citizenship, it just means that the Israelis ignore my American passport. Something they wouldn't do with most of you if you're Jewish American, because you can be here as a American citizen and get Jewish citizen, uh, get Israeli citizenship and still operate freely from the river to the sea. We don't have that ability. But when I met Bernie, we, we talked a lot, we met a lot, always trying to find what to do next, what to articulate next. And we wrote that article back in 2010, which to me struck home exactly the kind of conversation that we should have, which is independent and interdependent as a theme, but to go further than the theme, because we live in a very sloganistic society, both in Israel and Palestine. People get all excited about throwing slogans out, but don't really scratch the surface of what those slogans mean. I found a thought partner in Bernie that allowed us to go a little bit deeper. We're not solving the issue uh, ourselves, but we are scratching the surface to the point where we can find our differences, so we can actually articulate and think further individually and collectively of what those differences mean. So from a slogan to full disagreement, uh, there's a whole spectrum, and that's where we've worked throughout, throughout this decade. And now we're probably at the point where we can focus on some of the real differences between us. And those differences don't make us throw the baby out with the bathwater. We have a very constructive way to continue to engage on things that we disagree with. Uh, but in Confederation, we found common ground. Uh, we're still at the, I don't wanna say the surface because we've dug a little bit deeper than the surface, uh, but we are working out what it means mechanically as well, uh, both from a political perspective, which is my focal point here because we are living a political crisis par excellence, but also an economic perspective as well. And Bernie taught me a lot about how much economy really does play a role in any kind of political arrangement. So that's where we come from uh, here. Um, Go ahead. Well, uh, I'm, I'm in your hands if you'd like. I mean, I'd like, uh, why don't I sort of uh, get to the nettle um, of what confederation is because I think some people may still find the word a bit exotic. Um, 
Perfect. Uh, exactly what I was going to ask you to do. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, let's think about this. Uh, first of all, as I said before, um, not as a, um, in any sense, uh, a, a repudiation of the two-state concept. It's actually, in our view, the realization of the two-state concept. And as I said, it's kind of frustrating for us that this has not been clearer all along. And let me say what I mean by that. Um, first of all, uh, you spoke about the norms that we share. The most important norms, of course, are liberal democratic norms. We, we believe in sovereignty deriving from the informed consent of the governed. And we believe therefore, since there are two um, significant concentrated uh, populations with distinct national languages, histories, um, inflected religious experiences and so forth in this land, the two-state solution can never somehow be transcended. Uh, there will always be a need for a two-state solution because both peoples will want their state and their place in the sun. Um, it is not our view that what we're offering is a way out of a conversation about a two-state solution. Rather, what we're trying to do is focus attention on what a two-state solution really has to look like and always really has to look like. Sam actually uh, noticed that the original partition agreement that was um, UN Resolution 181 back in 1947 was actually a confederation with a shared capital and an economic union because anyone who was on the ground looking at a just solution at that time understood that this was going to be inevitable. So what do I mean by a confederation? First of all, let's um, be clear about what it is not. It is not a one state solution. All of the arguments that have been mounted uh, against a two state solution because of settlements, because of uh, because of uh, the fragmentation of the Palestinian side, partner, no partner, all the, all the rhetoric we hear about why a two-state solution is so-called dead makes a one-state solution ridiculous. So if you want to understand what a one-state solution looks like, that's what we have. We have the only possible one-state solution that we are going to ever see, which is an occupation of Palestine by Israel. And when I say Palestine, I think it's important. And this I've learned from Sam, it's very important to recognize. Palestine has been recognized as a state by 139 countries. The question is not whether Palestine will have a state or will be a state. The question is whether Israel will stop occupying it. And that has to be um, uh, understood in the context of what a peace will have to look like. Um, I should add that when we, we talk about confederation, uh, as we talk about a two-state solution, we're not talking about something that we think is going to happen tomorrow because we understand that the forces that seem to prefer a fight to the finish or are making maximal claims one side against the other are stronger in our, in our peoples right now. And it's going to be a generational uh, change, a generational uh, struggle to get the peace camp on both sides to recognize that this is what a two-state solution really has to look like. Having said that, I don't want to imply by that that there isn't a state of, that there isn't a great urgency to this conversation. There is an urgent, problem right now, which is that there's violence simmering beneath the surface. You cannot have, uh, I think it was Spinoza who once said that, that uh, peace is not the absence of violence, but the presence of justice. And when there's injustice, violence will always be imminent. 
this conception of confederation that we're putting forward will provide, I hope, a horizon. But the horizon is exactly what allows you to take steps today. And the important thing is to begin to take steps. Perhaps the most obvious one is to allow people like Sam, who had 15 years to struggle, to come to Palestine and gain residency, to, to come and build businesses the way he did. Anyway, I'll get back to that uh, later. Um, Confederation is not, as it's sometimes presented, unfortunately, an effort to reconcile maximal aims. That is to say, you know, that you take the um, settlers who say that they want to go back, uh, sorry, the settlers who say that they want to live and have a right to live in Hebron and have a right to live in Naples and so on. And then take refugees who say, I have a right to live in Haifa, I have a right to live in Jaffa. It's not an effort to say, you know what? They both have rights to the whole land. Let's just sort of build states which claim and have sovereignty over, each has sovereignty over the whole land. There is a, a group in Israel called A Land for All, which is sort of making this case. It's, it's in our view, not a realistic way to talk about confederation. Um, you, cannot, um, you, you cannot talk about something like a single parliament. You can't talk about something like mutual claims to the whole land. You have to understand that there's going to be a border between two states. The question is, will it be a hard border? or a dotted line border in which each state will have special rights that are negotiated by sovereign entities. Um, I'll say something else. If there were no settlers anywhere in the West Bank, in Palestine, if there were no refugees anywhere outside of what is now Israel, Confederation would still have to be the only way that these two states could ever live and thrive next to each other. Um, and finally, this is not a case where we are looking to Canada or looking to the EU. And in spite of the fact that we have examples of states that are um, developing relations one with the other, um, the way confederal relations normally develop, namely sovereign states figuring out what their common interests are with neighboring states and, and entering into agreements that allow for those common interests to be pursued. If, but if there were no other confederations in the world, if there were no other confederations in history, it would have to have been invented. The concept would have to have been invented for this one case. Why? Let me uh, just show you something. So if you just look at Israel and Palestine together, um, you're looking at a territory which is about the size of Los Angeles. Um, everything north of Beersheba is real Israel. Look at West Bank and Gaza. Everything below this is nice. It's, it's desert, it's nice for a little vacation, but it's not really a serious part of the country. This is where the country is. This is where Israel is. And this is where Palestine is. And the entire area here is about the size of greater Los Angeles. We're talking about 14 million people, about 8,000 square miles. We're talking about distances that are um, remarkably small. The distance from Herzliya to Nablus, which is the high-tech center of Israel to the uh, um, probably not the 
largest and at least uh, the second largest commercial center in Palestine and the place where the stock exchange is, that whole uh, distance is about the distance from Kennedy Airport to Newark. So let's understand the scale of this thing. Um, moreover, if you start thinking about how scale yields problems, just security problems, the green line is here, Tel Aviv Airport, Ben Gurion Airport is here. When planes come in and land, they almost always have to fly over Palestinian territory to land. It's almost impossible to imagine a security arrangement which is not cooperative, where you have both governments committed to a collective security regime. The same is true about Jerusalem, just on the question of uh, the distance between the messianic yeshivot, which would like to take down the mosques, and the distance to the mosque, which is about 300 yards. We know that we are going to have recalcitrant populations in both peoples who are perfectly capable of committing atrocities in order to polarize the situation. Confederation assumes that there's going to be some form of collective security environment guaranteed by both governments so that if an atrocity happens, and it's almost inevitable that it will, and we saw how it happened during the Oslo process, so that when an atrocity happens, no matter which side commits it, it's not going to lead to the polarization that draws the two people apart where each government is blaming the other and saying, if you don't handle this, I'm gonna to have to invade, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna to have to, on the contrary, what you'll then have is a single committed um, confederal system, at least with regard to, uh, to uh, security, security cooperation so that people who commit atrocities will be seen as violating the decision of the majorities on both sides to seek peace and not appear to be just zealot, zealots uh, trying to uh, fight for their own national life. Um, there is more to say. I'm going to uh, go through it quickly. Um, Jerusalem as a shared capital is by now and has been under occupation for 70 years, for uh, 50 years. Jerusalem today is uh, a city where separation of one population from the other is virtually impossible to imagine. It is structurally integrated. Um, it's also the case that some 50% of employed Arabs in East Jerusalem work in West Jerusalem. Um, there are Jewish neighborhoods dotted around the, the city. I'm not saying, and I know Sam certainly would not agree, that the way Jerusalem looks today is the result of justice. There could have been more attention to the um, to the uh, separate populations years ago and include Jerusalem in uh, Palestinian territories, but that was not the case. And But we live with this reality today. And when Mahmoud Abbas and Ehud Olmert negotiated over Jerusalem in 2008, what they came to was in effect a confederal solution for Jerusalem that there would be a single municipality, that each state would have its capital in its side of the city, that the Holy Basin, the areas of the old city and the uh, Mount of Olives and the area that's now uh, under um, what's called the City of David, but is really an, architect, uh, an archeological site would all be under international uh, custodianship. So the question of a sovereignty would not become contentious. Israel, Palestine, 
Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the United States would all have um, representation on the international custodian. Um, after all, we're talking about a big museum anyway. No one, I mean, no one has to worry about sort of zoning decisions to see whether, whether you know, um, you know, the Hilton hotels are going to put up a casino in the middle of Jerusalem. That's not that's not the issue. The problem is how do you maintain this treasure? Um, now, as far as jurisdictions are concerned, in an area this small, it's really impossible to think of the jurisdictions exercised normally by states without impinging on jurisdictional authority in the other state. Think of water, which is not just drilling into aquifers. We're talking now about creating water. We're talking about using electricity to create water. Much of Israel's water today, it's not pumped from the Sea of Galilee or from the uh, water uh, table. It's pumped, it's created through desalination. Jordan is going to need that kind of water. Palestine will need that kind of water. And so the infrastructural activities around the creation of fundamental things where states exercise jurisdiction are gonna to have to be done together. An electric grid will have to be together. Uh, bandwidth, you know, um, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum that allows um, our uh, allows our uh, uh, devices to work uh, in in Wi-Fi. All of that is going to have to be developed together. That is to say, each state is going to have to negotiate in a third entity in order to create some way of reconciling the interests of each. Think of epidemiology. Um, right now, Israel is completely vaccinated. I think it's uh, a, a terrible thing that this country has not also helped Palestine vaccinate. But it's impossible to imagine um, disease control in such a small area without the two countries working together. Um, I could go on, emergency, uh, forest fires, um, uh, you know, finding ways of creating uh, tourism on both sides of the line so that you have commercial integration so a tourist can go from one part of Jerusalem to the next without having to, um, uh, to change currencies or anything like that. The idea that these two countries can be pulled apart is in my view, uh, not the case. Um, they have to be independent of one another, but they have to be uh, deeply interdependent in the exercise of their jurisdictions and always had to be. Um, I'll say uh, one last thing along these lines, which is that what I've just described are constraints on independence, but they're also tremendous opportunities. Business today is not two states and two peoples creating fortresses as we thought of business in the 1940s and 50s that emerging economies would be self-sufficient and they would engage in import substitution policies. And you know, uh, so the state of Israel will have its own steel and car industry and Palestine will have its own None of that is the case anymore in the business world. States are hubs. Urban populations are hubs. They're hubs, they're networks of intellectual capital, which is shared science, network effects, and the entrepreneurial activities that allow individuals within these networks to develop products that can serve much larger groups of people than the people in their own immediate community. Um, it's a fact, but in this sense, a good fact 
that Israel and Palestine are so close together because if you are a Palestinian entrepreneur, um, where would you rather be than between Amman and Tel Aviv? You don't wanna be between Cairo and Benghazi. If you're going to build businesses, you have a tremendous amount of know-how that one can gain by working and partnering with Israeli technology companies. But at the same time, if you are an Israeli business, there are tremendous opportunities working with Palestinian companies. After all, Palestinians, particularly in Amman, Jordan, Palestinians, a million Palestinians have cycled through the Gulf. Uh, a million Palestinians have cycled through the, the Gulf states and there's no how, but there's also no about. That's also intellectual capital. Um, if you are an Israeli business and you need a partner to go after markets in the Gulf, um, the best possible partners you can have are in Palestine. So lots of opportunity here. We can talk more about that later. I just wanna close with one last point which is that um, we do have nevertheless um, refugees who will not ever uh, agree to give up their right of return. And there are some parts of Israel where lands that were um, uh, given up in uh, 48 in the crisis of the 48 war could be returned to. They haven't been built on yet. And there could be Palestinian families who want to come back. There are also some settlers who, if they agree to um, obey the laws of Palestine and live under Palestinian sovereignty, may say, look, we want to stay. You know, Ariel today is a city of almost 20,000 people. Um, if they want to stay, could there not be some form of residency, which allows you to stay as a permanent resident of Palestine with Israeli citizenship or a permanent resident of Israel with Palestinian citizenship. If you are a, an Israeli living in Ma'ala Adumim, for example, and you want to stay in Ma'ala Adumim under Palestinian authority, but you want to vote in Israel, your drive to Jerusalem will be about seven minutes. If you're living in the Valley of Jezreel as a Palestinian returning to land from before um, the uh, 48 war, and you wanna vote in Palestine and you wanna drive to Jenin, that's 20 minutes. I mean, let's get real here. As if you create this form of residency reciprocal residency, which you can only do if you have confederal relations of this kind, you can resolve probably the most um, volatile problem that the uh, Palestine-Israeli conflict presents. Um, so I'm just going to stop there um, and let Sam uh, correct me. Yes, please. Thank you so much, Bernie. And, and Sam, I want to invite you to share your perspective on this same, uh, to expand a little bit more. And then we do want to save some time for some question and answer. For sure. Thank you. Uh, Bernie and I are like two deep sea divers. The only difference is he's already at 1,500 feet below sea level. I stay about 300 feet below sea level because I need to get back to the surface. And I'll tell you why in a second. Before I get into the mechanics of, uh, and I'll call them high level mechanics of confederation, I would just like to lay out four reasons why I'm addressing this now. Because as we've acknowledged, confederation as a term has been around. There are some nuances that we bring to the table that I think others have missed. Uh, but nonetheless, there, for me, the first reason this is important at this time is that a lot has happened since 1967. And one of the major things that happened built on the Palestinian Declaration of Independence that emerged uh, around the first Intifada in 1988 
is that on November 29th, 2012, the Palestinians brought their case after the failure of the Oslo Accord to the General Assembly of the UN and basically said, world bilateral negotiations failed, multiple times, by the way. And we're going to put this in front of you because this is where this crisis started from. Is Palestine worthy of statehood or not? And the majority of the countries of the world said yes. That was a pivotal, pivotal moment because it actually upgraded. We were already in the UN as the PLO, but this upgraded our status as a non-member observer state. And with that upgrading came many tools. I only wish they would have called it, the Palestinian leadership would have called it in the resolution, the new state of Palestine, kind of like New Zealand. So we can make a distinction between the new state of Palestine, which acknowledges a historic concession that the Palestinians made, which is acknowledging 78% of British mandated Palestine to be Israel. Uh, that was a political decision not made by me. It was made by the po Palestinian political agency for better or for worse. And that's an issue to be discussed, but it was done. And it was acknowledged and it is acknowledged by all of the PLO factions. That's an important concept to respect the Palestinian political agency, no matter how weak it is. And here I'll speak as an American. We recognize the political agency of the United States for the last four years, no matter how weak it was, right? So political agency is a trick word that we have to maintain. So Palestinian statehood for me is water under the bridge. And as Bernie noted, our state exists and it exists in the General Assembly resolution with the majority of the countries of the world acknowledging it. One thing is missing, which is an agreement with Israel on where our Western border exists. We say based on the 1967 borders, almost like another concession not on the 1967 borders, based on the 1967 borders. So Palestinians are unbelievably uh, flexible in trying to give concessions to bring Israel to its senses. It's not working. By the way, the world recognized Israel back in 1948. And they like to boast that the US recognized them 11 minutes after the announcement of the state of Israel. But they also have the same flaw. They have not defined their borders, especially not their Western border. So all we're asking for today is those remaining countries to actually recognize both states to be able to normalize how they view them in political terms. So then we can talk about the real issue, which is how are they going to live together? And that's where confederation comes into play. The second reason why I thought this was so important at this time is that the situation on the ground is deteriorating at a pace that is taking us to another round of full-scale violence. I actually wrote about this in an article in Haaretz in August of 2020, uh, and it's playing out right now. The tinder box called Jerusalem is about to explode. But one place I would disagree with my colleague Bernie is violence is not percolating underground. Violence is above ground and has been percolating for the last 54 years. It's called settlements, it's called the siege of Gaza, it's called bombing of Gaza three times, uh, killing thousands of people. It's called settlements expanding from when I arrived here, there were 100,000 settlers on the ground. Through a peace process, it's reached now around 650,000 settlers on the ground. Those settlers are created by violence, by confiscating land, by putting military might on the ground in the West Bank, destroying our ability to have a natural habitat to grow in. So the issue of violence has brought us to a point where what we're seeing today is child's play compared to what may come in the very near future. Uh, thus, confederation and to start to think forward to me is an important issue, even though in Palestine today, and I know there's some Palestinians even on the call, they might look at me a little bit oddly by saying, what are you talking, everything is collapsing around us, including the Palestinian political system. What are we talking about? And I'm saying what we're talking about is not looking at what's in front of us, but looking how to run forward, how to restructure our discussion and the language and the, the political arrangement with the Israelis so there's a future that both parties can be uh, focused on. 
And here, in terms of the, the, the urgency of the matter, I should note that the issue of urgency is something which is, uh, you know, it's, it's sloganistic in a way. We've been urgent since I arrived here. Everything has been urgent. It's been urgent to negotiate the next round. It's been urgent to do this and do that. But in terms of urgency, there is a mechanical way to get on the right track. And Bernie alluded to it, and the title of this talk is that article that we wrote in Haaretz, which basically says states sign on to treaties and protocols and conventions. And there are many two states that are living fine next to each other. Think Canada and the US, think all of the European Union. And they didn't always like each other, right? Think Europe. But those two states today, when they have issues, they go to the international venues of the world to be able to apply the rules, which are time tested on how they should resolve many of the many day-to-day -day issues, like telecommunication interference, like how to divide water, which is shared between the two sides, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If Israel was serious about a two-state solution, those protocols that the world has applied could be applied today, especially from 2012 forward, given we were upgraded in the UN and became members of many of those international venues. So the urgency here is a reflection of the deterioration that is happening in a very rapid way. Thirdly, and this is more of an internal issue, the Palestinian internal affairs is collapsing as we're speaking. And I hear I don't only speak of the elections and what's happening with the elections right now, which is a sad chapter in our history, um, but I'm talking about the judiciary system, healthcare, education, our economy. I give Israel a lot of credit. The pressure they have put on the Palestinians for 54 years, not to count 73 years, has worked. It is tearing our society apart from the inside. And it's up to us Palestinians to deal with this very fragile reality, to stay together, to be able to carry us through this very difficult phase. Because issues that are being damaged internally, like our education system, is causing us not to have the labor needed to be able to build for statehood. And I can give a whole talk just about that, but uh, I think the point was made. The last point in terms of the the framing of now why confederation, it's the fiasco of the Trump administration. The damage that Trump did, both rhetorically and policy-wise, and mobilizing in Israel, the furthest right wing you can think about and emboldening them, emboldening them to the point where they won't even let us vote in Jerusalem because they feel the US is still behind them. All of this Trump era, basically created an opportunity for Biden to build back better, to use his words. If build back better means anything, it means build back better in the relationship between the US and this conflict. And building back better for me means starting by recognizing the state of Palestine, but don't stop there. Think of how those two states could be working together and create an environment where both interests of both peoples are geared towards working together. That brings us to confederation. For me, confederation addresses the, the Palestinian sovereignty issue and the Israeli sovereignty issue. I would claim that Israel today doesn't have a clear birth certificate yet. It has one signature left on it, and that's ours. The Palestinians have not signed off on the state that was built on their rooms. So there has to be a way that both Israeli independence and Palestinian independence can be achieved. So we can start thinking about the future. If we continue to think about hardline positions, not taking in consideration poor leadership on both sides, bad decisions on both sides, and the reality of 70 years have passed, then we'll be in the sloganistic reality forever. And what we're talking with Confederation is a model of how to bring the two state solution to fruitation. It's not gonna solve everything. It gets us on the right track. And given those two state protocols that are existing in the world, if we agree to those two states, we have for Israel, Israel has not for us yet recognized us. If we can agree to those two states, then we start with those protocols and where those protocols don't work, 
or are not made to work, like the issue of settlements or the issue of uh, refugees, those are the real issues that should be on the negotiating table. Two other important points. One, everything I just said and my mindset and my school of thought comes from my commitment to a rules-based world. A rules-based world, one that we almost lost during the last four years, but a rules-based world does have rhyme and rhythm. It's not all perfect, it's not all exact, but there is rhyme and rhythm of how a rules-based world operates. And when you see the largest Israeli human rights organization calling Israel apartheid, when you see the largest international and US human rights organization, Human Rights Watch, calling Israel apartheid, when you see seven, eight years ago, Jimmy Carter, an ex-president, a former president, write a book with the title apartheid in it as relation to Israel in the West Bank and Gaza, if we're not waking up, then that's a problem in itself. So the issue is not that we're in some kind of holding pattern and having a convenient discussion about what academically is the best way forward. We are in a hardcore, difficult position of making political decisions and converting our thinking to policy so both sides can start to see, number one, that there is an end game. Number two, the end game is not based on a cigar-filled backroom discussion. It's built on a rules-based order. And at the end of the day, those two states that we're talking about, Palestine and Israel, are the ingredients for confederation. Palestine free from military occupation, and hopefully, hopefully Israel free from fear as well. And those two states can start to think of where they want to operate together because it's in their interest to operate together. No illegal reality is imposed on either side. No settlement is imposed on the Palestinians. That's a negotiated item that the Palestinians will have to agree to. No settler per se by name will exist in the Palestinian state. Although there may be Jewish Israeli citizens who gain residency in the Palestinian state. It's a decision of the Palestinian state to allow that or not. And that has zero uh, uh, equivalency to the issue of refugees. The refugees is, has, have a collective, and actually I have an article coming out later today about this, uh, have a, a, a codified, a codified set of rights based in international law, and by the way, things that Israel has committed to at its founding that will have to be addressed by Israel. So I don't dump everything in one bucket and start to equate them just to get out. I look at each component of this as uh, what it is, what applies to it in a rules-based world, and more importantly than all of that, how are we going to live together because that is the only way forward. I can say that the Palestinian state will exist whether there's confederation or not. I believe that it will. But that means Israel sooner or later will not exist. Israelis can say, whether you like it or not, the land is ours from the river to the sea and we just legislated in the Knesset, the nation state law, which actually says that. They can do that and they've done it. It's not making it reality today. So ultimately the whole concept of confederation is how do we take the issue of a two-state framework, because we're already there, in my opinion, and start to think forward of how to get the populations to have an interest to work together? And the only way that can happen if the Palestinians are not under military occupation. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, both Sam and Bernie, for uh, setting the stage. We now have about 15 minutes for question and answer, and I want to acknowledge that uh, several of you have already submitted questions in the chat, and that is the best way for you to do that. Uh, given the number of people that we have attending today, we are not going to be asking, I repeat, we are not going to ask you to unmute and ask the question yourself. I've been monitoring the chat, and I will ask the questions. Um, which I'm not going to identify who asked them because many of them were a composite of uh, several different people's comments that they have put them in. And I ask for your forgiveness in advance. I do not expect that we are going to be able to get to all of the questions. So my first question is to um, both of you. From where in the political arena, Israeli, Palestinian, or both, 
will the voices for this model emerge? Okay, so let me uh, start with Israel. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, look, there are many people in the Israeli political in Israeli political life who commit to two states. Um, it's obvious that they are stuck. Whether it's uh, the Labour Party leader Merav Michaeli or um, people even like Yair Lapid who have been openly committed to a, a two-state model. Um, the whole so-called center left in Israel, which is roughly 50% of the country that votes, um, is committed to two states and persuaded that Palestinians have no interest in pursuing it. Or, or they are persuaded that Oslo proved that since Palestinians are fragmented and or the dangers to uh, Ben Gurion airport coming from rockets or something like that, reproducing the situation that we have in Gaza, et cetera. It's not worth it. We're in the best of all possible worlds. We don't have a two-state solution, but we don't not have a two-state solution. And we're perfectly happy with the status quo um, sure, we think that the settlers are a bit of a pain. Not only are they uh, making our lives a little more difficult in the West Bank, but they also are kind of theocrats and they have rather um, hopelessly populist and uh, undemocratic views that they're trying to impose on the rest of the country. And in some ways they have colonized not just the West Bank, but the settlers have colonized the Likud and colonized the Israeli right wing. So um, in order to think about advocates for confederation, you basically have to go back to the people who are in, interested in a two-state solution. My most obvious case is Yossi Balin, with whom Sam and I are in contact who was one of the architects of Oslo and is now completely devoted to confederation as an idea. And we have to make what, you know, sort of Yossi's transformation, the transformation that we see in the rest of the center left. I have no illusions about going to settlers and saying, you know something, this, is, this model is for you because they're not committed to democratic norms. They think that the land is theirs because, you know, Jews wanted it so much for so long. Or that God promised it to them. They're living in a different paradigm. They don't think of sovereignty deriving from the consent of the governed. And as a result, we don't really have a, a chance to have a, a useful dialogue with them. But everybody in the country who's committed to what I would call bourgeois, secular, liberal norms are an obvious market into which to sell this idea because the idea of complete separation, which is what Oslo had, um, had initially uh, envisioned, a kind of re-imposition of a partition that didn't, that could have worked in 1948, but you know, somehow we have to make it work now. This whole idea of complete separation because of the uh, security issues, the uh, jurisdictional issues, the business and infrastructure issues, simply had no legs. And one terrorist on one side or one terrorist on the other side could just pull people apart. We need to have a different dialogue inside the Israeli peace camp. And the peace camp is actually big enough to be worthy of our attention. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. And ultimately, that's the, you know, okay, we have, a, we have a concept, we have some details of the concept, where to get traction. And that's exactly where Bernie and I are talking about these days. For me, on the Palestinian side, um, let me say first that the, the issue of confederation is a means for 
us Palestinians to be able to speak directly to the Jewish Israeli community and show that they have nothing to fear of a Palestinian state, the opposite. They have much to gain by ending this occupation and allowing Palestine to breathe normally because in joint efforts, they will have access to the region, not to create an arms deal like they did with Bahrain and Emirates, but to actually organically enter the Middle East where they happen to exist. And that's not gonna change anytime soon. In terms of where do we get traction, on the Palestinian side, the first community of people I would go to is the refugees. The refugees have been sitting for 73 years in refugee camps in Jordan, in Syria, in Lebanon. It's time to go to them and say, there is a model that brings you back home. It's a model that acknowledges that there have been historic concessions made by our leadership, whether you like it or not. There's a different reality on the ground, but the, the silver lining here is that 70% of Israel, where the refugees came from, is empty. So there is a place for them to go back to. And that would be, I think, because ultimately I don't agree that Jerusalem is the crux of the conflict. Jerusalem is a set of old stones that we're gonna figure out how to divide. Ultimately, it is our cultural capital. It means more to us than a museum, but I understand that it is uh, something which is more uh, a snapshot of history that's stuck there. Live people are not stuck anywhere. They are living in horrendous situations that need a solution sooner rather than later. Secondly, I would be going and I'm speaking and being consumed these days by the Palestinian political system's collapse as we speak. But up until today, I would go to all the Palestinian uh, PLO political parties who have all acknowledged their support for a two-state solution, who have all acknowledged their commitment to international law. And I would say, this is the implementation of what you've been talking about. Some of them will not fit that move because some of them are not sincere and moving forward with the implementation of two states, but rather call for it. I think the mainline parties and what we see in this last elections where 36 lists were created, the mass majority of them speak of two states. So the idea here would get them to move from speaking about two states to thinking about how to implement two states. Remember that 70% of our imports come from Israel today. 85% of our exports go to Israel today. It's, those numbers are high because it is a forced dependency that was created. But that forced dependency over a prolonged period of time also has some silver lining. We know the Israeli community better than they know us. We speak Hebrew. We know the places they live in because we used to live there. We know a lot about Israel that gives a soft landing to wanting to work together if we can see each other as equals and as peers. So we're not starting from zero. Although the history was bitter, there are some value, uh, for, there is some value from the experience that we can base it on. And one last one that people will not think about is our prisoners. One million Palestinians have gone through the Israeli political prison system. We have seen Israelis up front and some of, in their, some of them in the worst posture you can think about. And we've learned Hebrew and engaged them and talked about their kids and they started to talk about ours as a prisoner and prison warden. But that environment created a knowledge not only of who the Israelis are, but it dropped the fear that we have from the occupier. When I was here in the first Intifada, I can remember walking down a road, seeing a Jeep coming up the street changing roads. Today you have 16 and 17 year olds, if not younger, jumping on the back of a moving Jeep to hang a Palestinian flag. Although there's a lot of pride that we get in that, there's a lot of worry I have too, because I understand that when the command and control of the Israeli military says to act, they will not hesitate before shooting that person, for example. So although we have a dropping of fear, a knowledge of the Israeli side, remember, we cut their lawns, we paint their houses, we pick their tomatoes, we work. 
200,000 of us work every single day inside the Israeli economy. Regretfully, I think, Israel does not have that knowledge of us. The other for Israel is that person behind the wall who is probably a terrorist or violent at least, and somebody they don't want to think about. And they have the luxury to do that because they have been indoctrinated to think of the other as a monster and not a person. So I think that from a Palestinian side, confederation could make a lot of sense to people, those that understand that Israel's not going anywhere and neither is Palestine. That was exactly what Ed Edward Said once wrote. We need to get beyond that any of us are going anywhere. The idea is how to work together. And that's where I would stay. We're getting our support from. Yeah. Can I, I know you have other questions, but I, I just have to add one thing to this. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just lawns that get mowed. There are also Palestinian businesses in Hebron, in Nablus, that are part of Israeli supply chains. These are not working. These are not, you know, workers working for uh, uh, Israeli businesses. These are entrepreneurs who have set up businesses who are part of Israeli supply chain in furniture making, in food processing, in plastics, and um, it's very important to to recognize uh, that um, this codependency is also a codependency with a certain dignity and it's urban, it's urban. If you think of refugees coming back and occupying lands and all this kind of thing, we can get a little carried away and get spooked by notions that are really anachronistic. Less than 5% of the Palestinian economy today is agricultural less than 5%, less than 2% of Israeli GDP is agriculture. Um, we're looking at Palestinian cities that need to grow and need a thousand more Sambafors who are going to come and build businesses there and build businesses with Israeli partners if they choose to do it. And in Sam's case, when he put up uh, this shopping center and started a supermarket. He told me one of the first things he told me was that he got his inventory management system from Ritalix in Herzliya because he could have gone to NCR in Texas, but that was a lot further away. Why do that? So there are obvious opportunities here and opportunities of reciprocity and dignity. And we shouldn't just think of the Palestinian economy as a dependent workforce, um, you know, like like uh, Tijuana and San Diego. So I I can't believe how quickly our time together has passed. I'm going to ask one last question um, and recognize that there are so many more, and uh, hopefully we will have uh, further opportunities to engage with you. Um, how should Americans or others who care about this model, if you, you know, persuaded us that confederation is the way forward, what can we do to help nurture its viability? Sam, do you want to go? Yeah, first? I, can, I can start. I mean, wow, that's a big question because what, what I'm going to say doesn't apply only to Palestine. It applies to probably all of the world because what the US is doing is causing serious damage elsewhere as well. I think Iraq, think Afghanistan, think Syria, think Lebanon. First and foremost, we need to be able as Americans to be committed to a rules-based world. If we don't have that, then we're committed to a, uh, you know, the, the, the law of the jungle. And the law of the jungle, then anything goes. Don't come and tell Palestinians why you're violent or tell Israeli settlers why they're violent or Israeli government. It all goes, there's no, there's no discussion. So rules-based world is number one. And rules-based world means to commit to the human rights acts that have been passed, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, et cetera. That's number one. Number two, act in US interests. Sounds odd, right? Talking to an American audience. But I think that the lobbyists in Washington, the lobbyist money in Washington has taken the political system in the US hostage. And nowhere more can that be seen than in Israel-Palestine. Um, when you have the pro-Israeli lobby legislating uh, or promoting legislation across 20-some states to 
criminalized the boycott campaign, which is a nonviolent campaign to hold Israel accountable. This is something which is uh, interfering with US constitutional rights. And I would note here that I'm a board member, as was noted, of Just Vision. Just Vision is a DC-based documentary maker. And we're about to launch this year, hopefully, a documentary that we've been working on for the last several years, which is going to bring home the issue that Americans are losing their constitutional rights because of Palestine Israel, because Palestinians have been criminalized. And that's going to be something worthy to watch. So number, number one is uh, rules-based. Number two is stop criminalizing people who are acting Americans who are acting in solidarity with the Palestinians. Thirdly, this tag of anti-Semitism, anytime you want to be critical of the state of Israel's actions, is being done in a hyper-political fashion to the point where it's demeaning to the word anti-Semitism. Instead of talking about real anti-Semitism that exists and should be fought by all of us, now when I talk about settlements and when I talk about the apartheid system that we're living under, all of a sudden I become an anti-Semite. And I think that's something where not only Americans in general, but Jewish Americans in general should put their foot down and say, no, that's not the case. There is a difference between critical about a state and being anti-Semitic, which I don't think anybody would uh, disagree with fighting. So that's another thing. And thirdly, let's remember that at the end of this, there, you know, as we're moving forward, there are 5 million Palestinians under occupation that wake up every morning and have to deal with this every single day. So while we're doing the political work, while we're trying to advocate, let's not forget that there are Palestinians in need. And the best way to be able to do something on the ground is to be in solidarity with those in need. And whether it's a rabbi coming with a group to hear Palestinians directly, something most Jewish Americans don't get to hear, or it's picking a student and trying to support them, or other acts of solidarity, these kinds of acts can go a far way. First, for the person invoking the act, because they would be doing something concretely, but also for the receiving party to understand that the world has not forgotten them. And I would say one level, one level further than that is when Jewish Americans act in solidarity, it's a double whammy for Palestinians. Because first, we understand the world has not forgot us, and second, we stop equating Israeli policies to every Jew in the world, because that's not fair as well. Thank you. Um, Bernie, I'm going to ask you just if you can be very brief, because I know you actually have another appointment and we want to make sure that we can wrap up the program fully. Right. I just want to add to the kinds of things that can be done, public policy issues that can be done. When you have a horizon, you know how to take steps toward it. And this is, for us, fundamental. The Biden administration could do three, four things today, which would, in my view, not inflame the situation. On the, on the contrary, would uh, in some ways allow the antagonism to subside. Um, one would be allowing Palestinians to come and build businesses in Palestinian cities. Simple. Now, that's not up to the Biden administration, but the Biden administration can demand it to begin to invest in infrastructural projects that bring the two states ultimately together in the manner that they would ultimately have to be brought together, like the uh, Med uh, the Med Dead or Red Dead Canal project, both of which have been on the boards for many years and still have not been enacted, which could provide desalinated water and, elect and hydroelectricity to both countries and to Jordan as well. I know that the Jordanian government would certainly be interested in the latter. Um, there are also immediate projects which could be of great uh, relaxation of tension, like um, completing the, uh, the uh, gas line to Gaza so that uh, the Gaza power station can begin to uh, work 24 seven and begin to uh, develop desalinated water as well. There are 
things that the Biden administration can do when it acknowledges that it's working toward this kind of reciprocity um, and not put either side at risk with regard to their security. Um, I also think, and this is the final thing, um, there, one could recognize the world's recognition of a Palestinian state. Um, I'm not even sure that the American government would have to recognize a Palestinian state, um, but it could at least acknowledge that the state of Palestine is recognized by a majority of countries in the General Assembly. It could be uh, a very um, almost aside. I know it's that wouldn't satisfy Sam. Sam would like to see the American government actually recognize the state of Palestine. I think that might be a bridge too far for the Biden administration, but it could at least acknowledge that this recognition is already international. Right. And the question is how to end the occupation of one state by the other. I, yes. I, have a, I have a much shorter bridge this week. Allow us to hold elections in East Jerusalem. Ah, yes. That's a short bridge that we can act on all right now because that's going Absolutely. to bring this to a that would be point. <laughs> that would be an extremely important gesture that shows that projects to the Arab world and particularly to the Palestinians on the ground that the American government understands a future Palestinian state as having a capital in Jerusalem. And, and with that, we're going to we're going to have to leave it there um, with great gratitude for uh, your sharing your ideas, your wisdom, your thoughts with us today. Uh, we are going to close out with some uh, words from Rabbi Allen and Phyllis. But before I turn the program over to them, I want to conclude my portion as we began with poetry, and that is with words tried electively to the bloodlines, to the lives of two more extraordinary men. First will be the Israeli voice of Yehuda Amichai in his poem, Jerusalem. On a roof in the old city, laundry hanging the late afternoon sunlight, the white sheet of a woman who is my enemy, the towel of a man who is my enemy to wipe off sweat of his brow. In the sky of the old city, a kite, at the other end of the string, a child I can't see because of the wall. We have put flags, they have put up flags to make us think that they are happy, to make them think we're happy. And now the American Palestinian voice of Sharif El Musa in his poem, A Day in the Life of Nablus. In the gowns of soft lights, the town performs the ritual of sleep. Will they caress the mouth of the vendor and the silence of the woman who lost her house? The settlement, fortress on the mountain peak and the jail on the hilltop flood their sleep with yellow lights. I want the kind breeze, the power of pears, the sound of the flute, melodious and sad, like the hills of this land to grant us all, vendors and soldiers, grant us ample love, that we may turn this troubled page, that we may sleep with a sweet mouth. Thank you, Sam and Bernie, for your inspiring words and to all of you for attending. I'm delighted to turn the program over to Rabbi Allen and to Phyllis to close this remarkable program. So uh, let me just say, thank you very much. You know, I have to cut out now. I'm sorry, I can't hear your blessings, Rabbi. We all need blessings. Um, but I have to be uh, somewhere downtown Jerusalem in about a half an hour. So I'm gonna have to leave. Uh, thank you all thank very, you. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me just conclude with very briefly because I think that the words that have been shared today have demonstrated the importance of what it means to really be in serious conversation. And as Sam said, not be deluded by sloganeering uh, and, uh, and, and uh, the, simple, the simple notion that this, putting a sign resolves a, 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 a conflict. When Phyllis and I sat in Ramallah uh, two and a half years ago uh, and uh, were greeted with wonderful coffee uh, uh, and, and, and an, an openness that was 
significant. I realized that in all the trips that I had been privileged to lead to the land of Israel over all the years with our community, that not once had I really ever taken the time to go the same distance that Sam was from Bernie at this point, that I am now from Sharon Press and to travel into Palestine and to see a world there as well. And until we begin as Jews to understand that when we go to Israel, we have a moral responsibility to open up those doors and to walk into those rooms and to learn who our family and friends and co-religionists will live with, God willing, for generations to come. Until we understand those encounters as serious and as necessary, then nothing will change in our lives here and little will change in Israel and Palestine. The power to make a difference is actually in our hands with kindness, with a belief in the dignity of human beings and with the belief that my, what my father always shared with me when I was five and six and seven years old, there are only three things that defined what it meant to be Jewish. Keep kosher, love Israel and vote democratic. Well, if I am going to love Israel, I also have to learn how to love my neighbors and my friends in Palestine. And at the end of the day, our task is great. We may not complete it, but Phyllis and I will continue to wage a violent free battle to ensure that the dignity of Israelis and Palestinians is, main, is, is secured for our children's children's generation, if not for our own. In closing, I just want to thank Sharon, who has had done a tremendous amount of work, Monica and uh, Kelly and Leslie Morris, who have chaired this event, our rabbinic leadership at the congregation for taking this on, Francis and Bernie for the tech support, and most of all, the 138 people who signed on for this program today, who have demonstrated that serious substantive discussion is what will ultimately bring about change. It is not, as Sam said, sloganeering. It's about digging deep into the reality and in the process, finding solution. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you all for joining today and let us all go with a renewed commitment to ensuring security for Israel, peace for Israel and Palestine, dignity for the Palestinians and hope for a world sorely in need of it. Shalom, salam. Thank you very much and thanks for having us. And thanks for so many windows that have couples. That's a great notion. <laughs>